Uh, so I'm Vincent Liu. Um, I'll be the session chair for uh, this session. Um, so for folks that are just joining us, uh, the way this is going to work is that um, we're going to play a video for you and then have an opportunity for a Q&A session with the authors. Um, all of the questions should go in the Slack channel for this session, right? So uh, the name of the channel in, in the SIGCOM workspace is SIGCOM 2021-TS2, all right? So please uh, um, put all of your questions there uh, whenever they come up, okay? So uh, yeah, so we've got four talks for you today. Um, the first one uh, is on a paper understanding network or host network stack overheads by Chiza Kai. Um, he is a PhD student at Cornell working with uh, Rachit Ag Agarwal, um, and he is interested in building efficient network stacks for high speed networks. Um, so he'll be talking about a really interesting deep dive into uh, the interactions between host network stacks and fast networks. And why don't we play the video? Cycle, and where the main overheads come from. Let's start by looking at the network and the host hardware trends that motivate our work. For the internet and early generation data center networks, the network core was a primary bottleneck. This is because a single CPU core can easily saturate one to 10 gigabits and, is, and with relative recent optimization, even 40 gigabits. Hence, the main challenge in early generation network was to efficiently share network resource, such as switch buffer and switch bandwidth. Over the past two decades, network and CPU technology trends have been significantly different. In particular, network bandwidth has increased by 100x, thus requiring much more CPU resource for packet processing. However, slowdowns of Moore's laws has resulted in per core CPU performance and per server CPU capacity being largely stagnant. This had led to performance bottleneck shifting from the network core to the host network stacks. A single core can no longer set the entire access link bandwidth. And the challenge now is to efficiently share host resource, such as a CPU core, DRAM bandwidth, and L3 capacity. To address this new challenge, the community has been exploring a variety of potential solutions, including Linux kernel stack optimizations, RDMA, hardware offloads, and the user space stacks. The, the design space exploited by all these potential solutions will benefit from a detailed understanding of today's network stack overheads. Building such an understanding is the goal of our work. Before diving deeper into our results, let's briefly summarize our experimental setup and methodology. Our goal is to understand CPU overheads of the Linux kernel network stack. To ensure that our setup indeed push the performance bottlenecks to the host network stack, we use two servers connect directly over a 100 gigabit link. We are interested in understanding support, CPU utilization, CPU utilization breakdown. We also measure the low level system matrix like cache mix thread to improve insights on our evaluation results. We evaluate the impact of our various factors, starting with various optimization techniques like TSO GIO, Jumbo Frames, and AFS. TSO and the GIO are the well-known offload techniques for splitting and coalescing data respectively. Jumbo frame use nice and byte MTU size. Lastly, AFS steers the incoming packets to the core where the corresponding application is running so that the cache performance can be improved. We also consider different hardware configurations, namely DDIO, which is enabled by default on our servers, and it allows the NIC to directly DME packets into the L3 cache and the IO MMU, which allows per, per device virtual address space. Uh, further, we consider different traffic patterns and different flow size, including long flows, as well as a mixture of long and short flows. Finally, we also evaluate the impact of the packet drop and the congestion control protocols. Our study resulted in several interesting takeaways, which depart from conventional wisdom. First, Data copy is a primary bottleneck, with over 50% of all CPU cycles at the receivers spent in data copy. Second, the rapidly increasing access link bandwidth have led to the NIC DME pipeline becoming inefficient. 
For example, a large part of the data copy overheads come from significant increase in cache miss rate during data copy. This is because during DMA process, Nick overrides the data in the cache before the application is able to read it. Third, multiple flows sharing host results didn't have performance implication in the internet or in our early generation data center networks, since bottlenecks were in the network core. However, this is no longer the case. We see sharp integration in super core with increase in the number of flows sharing host resource. In the rest of the talk, I will walk you through each of these takeaway one by one and provide intuition and evidence for these observations. We start by looking at the performance of a single long flow. While this seemingly simple scenario was not very interesting for low bandwidth networks, in the context of high bandwidth networks, it already provides several interesting uh, new insights. Until 40 gigabits, a single core could saturate the excellent bandwidth. However, we find that multiple cores are needed to saturate 100 gigabits. We, success we successfully turn on the optimizations and see their effect on super core. Baseline here means there is no software and hardware optimizations are enabled. Here, super core is only 40 gigabits. Look at the corresponding CPU breakdown on the right. We see I, uh, we see that the TCP layers takes about the majority of CPU cycles. This is because TCP layer has to process MTU size packets, so per packet overhead is high. After enabling TSOGL, super per core increased to 15 gigabits. We see that TCP IP and the locking overhead are reduced as the network stack now operates on larger 64 kilobyte packets, since GIO will coalesce packets before TCP processing. The net device layer is responsible for several low-level packet processing functions. This is where GIO is implemented. And hence, we see a corresponding increase in overheads. Enabling 9,000 bytes jumbo frames further improves super per core to 27 gigabits. As we can see, it reduced GIO overhead as MTU is now larger and the bottleneck shift to data copy. After enabling AFS, Superbird core is to 42 gigabits. Enabling AFS co-locates interrupt processing on the application core, which leads to better cache locality. This improved data copy efficiency also reduced the overhead of the memory and SKB management. A uh, single data copy takes more than 50% of total CPU cycles. We need a better mechanism for reducing data copy overheads. Zero, zero copy techniques like TCP MAP and XTP could alleviate this bottleneck. However, they both require significant application logic change, and the latter requires implementing the network stack in user space. If we can realize an efficient zero copy mechanisms, it may be possible for a single core to saturate 100 gigabit links. Next, let's discuss how the NIC DMA pipeline has become inefficient. We find the high cache miss rate is a core reason for inefficiency of the NIC DMA pipeline. And there are two parameters that impact the cache miss rate, TCP RX buffer size and the NIC RX descriptor size. In this talk, I will focus on the first one. In the graph, we observe as we increase the TCP RX buffer size, super decreased due to high cache miss rate. This is because the larger TCP buffer size increased the amount of in-flight data, hence increased the packet processing latency at the host. We measure this latency in mix and then confirm this indeed happens. To understand the impact of this, let's look at the figure on the right. Say some packets arrived at the NIC. The NIC will transfer these packets to L3 until the L3 capacity used by DDIO is completely utilized. If packet processing latency at the host was low, the application would promptly copy this packet from the kernel buffer to application buffer from the L3. However, since the packet processing latency is high, by the time data copy starts, the NIC already overrides the data, overrides packets in the cache. As a result, data copy experiences high cache miss rate and the overall super core reduced. The above result suggests that in addition to classical parameters like bandwidth RTT, window size calculation should take host resource like L3 capacity and host packet processing latency into account. Another possible solution is to reduce host packet processing latency 
by parallelizing data copy dynamically across multiple cores. This can be achieved by decoupling data copy and packet processing, but will require re-architecting the network stack. Finally, let's look at how multiple flows sharing host resource impact host network stack performance. In the in-cast scenario, where a number of sender calls are sending data to a single receiver call, all flows are sharing receiver call resource, most notably the cache, which leads to cache contention and the subsequent poor performance. In this graph, when we increase the number of flows, the superpower core reduced and the cache miss rate increase. Next, we look at the case for all to all, where there is a flow between each sender and receiver core pair. Here, in addition to contention for CPU and the cache resource, the networking bandwidth becomes the bottleneck. Uh, we find that the further, uh, this further degrees superpower core as the number of flow increase, this can be explained by the following. Looking at the receiver side CPU breakdown, we find that scheduling overheads increase with more flows. This is because each flow receives a smaller share of the link bandwidth, causing application to go to sleep and wake up repeatedly while waiting for the packets. We also find packet aggregation techniques like GIO become less effective when more flows can then for host resource. This is because Lower per flow bandwidth resulted in reduced opportunity for coalescing packets. Overall, these results suggest the need for careful orchestration of the host resource among the contending flows. Such an orchestration is hard with TCP given its sender driven nature, since receivers have no control on when and how many senders can send data to them. Recent work on recent receiving receiver-driven transfer protocol like P-host, NDP, and HOMA could enable such an orchestration. More generally, we believe that designing transfer protocol for high bandwidth networks requires solutions that encamps techniques from not only computer networking, but also computer architecture and the operating systems. In summary, our study has three key takeaways. First, data copy is a primary bottleneck for high bandwidth networks, and we need to design effective the recopy maximum to alleviate this bottleneck. Second, the NIC DM pipeline has become inefficient, and we need to take host resource into account when choosing network parameters, and the recent design of the host network stack, as well as the host architecture in order in to improve the DM pipeline. Finally, host network stack performance degrades significantly with increase in number of flows connecting for host resource. We can use receiving driven transfer protocols to carefully orchestrate host resource. For more detailed analysis on even more workloads, please read our papers. All the tools used for profiling and measurement are available on our GitHub repository. All right, um, so thanks for that uh, talk. Uh, super interesting um, paper as well. Um, so I think there's a couple of people typing, but in the meantime, I had a question um, myself. So um, I guess a lot of noise has been made about networks outpacing CPUs in terms of speed, right? Um, so you know that tells me potentially, you know, one way is to uh, improve the network stack so that a single core can saturate an entire network. Uh, another potential solution would be to re-architect applications so that we have, let's say, more cores per, per link. Um, is there, do you have a sense for uh, whether that's a feasible solution in the long term or, you know, what types are, uh, whether your findings extend to a case where uh, we just, you know, pack more and more applications and expect them to not fill the network link? Uh, first of all, this is a good question. Uh, for current uh, bandwidth, like 100 gigabits, I do think a uh, single core might enough to saturate uh, 100 gigabits if we do the optimization, uh, like uh, zero copy techniques may actually uh, help the single core to saturate 100 gigabits. But since the bandwidth continue to increase and uh, more or less still, you know, this, uh, the slowdown for more slow still continues, then my hunch that eventually uh, we might need multiple cores 
to saturate the entire explain bandwidth. And until that point, I think the uh, orchestration of the network stack, like redesigning network stack might be necessary. Uh, do I answer all your questions? Maybe you can clearly state your second question. Yeah, so I think I think that's uh, um, essentially what I was getting at, actually. Okay. Um, but there's a, a question in chat, maybe we can move to that. Um, so uh, the question is, how do you measure the contributions of the different components? For instance, uh, TCP stack, data copy, uh, et cetera, to the overall CPU utilization. I see, I see. Um, there is a, we use standard tool uh, called Perf. Essentially, Perf can tell us each uh, function CPU uh, contributions. And so uh, we actually do a detailed analyze, like uh, which function belongs to uh, which layers. And after that, we can add something uh, together to get the overall contribution for each layer. And if you are interested uh, in this, uh, we actually including all our tools in the GitHub repo. You can read more for the details. Got it. Um, all right, so I think we have time for one more question. So um, are different OS kernel stacks or user space stacks likely to offer significantly different performance benefits or are they all feeding off of the same underlying pipeline and architecture and therefore limited in the benefits they might offer compared to each other? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, for the user space stacks, uh, my hunch that uh, there are two you know, different types of solution, where whether the zero copy is implemented or not. If the zero copy is not implemented in the user space stacks, my hunch is that all the three uh, observations we made should still apply to the user space as well. If the data copy, zero, zero copy is implemented, then clearly data copy is less interesting to the user space stacks. But for the for uh, the other two Boolean points we made will still apply. For example, uh, for the NIC DMA pipeline, uh, the issue actually will delay from the network stack to the application. What I mean is that essentially when the application reads the data, the NIC may actually overwrite the data before the application reads. So we might still see the cache misread, but not in the network stack, but actually in the application side. And the similar for the uh, resource sharing, the issues should still apply as well. Got it, thanks. Um, all right, so I think that's all the time we have. I think there's another question, maybe more in, in chat, uh, and we can take that offline. Sure. Um, but for the second uh, talk of this session, we've got one pipe. Um, the speaker is going to be uh, Bo Jia Li, uh, who's a senior engineer with Huawei Technologies. Uh, he, had, he obtained his PhD from the University of Science and Technology of China in 2019, uh, and his research interests are in data center networking and systems. Um, so why don't we go ahead and play the video. I'm Bo Jie Li from Huawei. It is my honor to speak at SIGCOM 21 about OnePipe, Scalable Total Order Communication in Data Center Networks. Ordering is fundamental in distributed systems. There are two kinds of ordering anomalies in a distributed system. The first kind violates causal ordering. For example, host A writes data to another host O, then sends a notification to host B. When B receives the notification, it issues a read to O, but may not get the data due to the delay of A's write operation. The second kind violates total ordering automaticity. Host A writes to both data O2 and metadata O1. Concurrently, Host B reads from both data O2 and metadata O1, but they may be inconsistent. We require a group of operations to be atomic in the case of concurrent transactions and failures. To avoid these two kinds of ordering anomalies, we propose a one big pipe abstraction. Messages are sent in groups called scatterings and serialized in a virtual pipe. Different receivers deliver messages in a consistent order, as if the scatterings are put out from the pipe and deliver to the receiver sequentially. Formally, one pipe provides causally and totally ordered communication support, which implies total order, causal order, and atomicity. We must make it clear that one pipe only provides restricted failure atomicity, because the seminal FLP theorem already said full failure atomicity is impossible. Replicating every message would introduce a too high overhead. Fortunately, we can apply the design principle of optimizing for the normal case. 
because data center is mostly reliable. We'll have a mechanism to invoke the application to handle the failures. Now we come to the core design of one pipe. How to achieve total ordering? The first storeman is the approach of Ares. Ares uses a programmable switch as a centralized sequencer, which keeps a counter for each receiver. When a receiver detects a gap in its sequence number, as shown in the red circles, the receiver knows that there is a lost message. The failure coordinator will use a traditional consensus algorithm to achieve consensus among replicas. However, the major problem is that the switch becomes a centralized bottleneck. Now we come to the second storeman. We synchronize physical time on senders. The messages are attached with physical timestamps. When a receiver receives a message, it first puts the message into receive buffer. The receiver maintains a timestamp for each sender and computes the minimum timestamp of all senders. If the minimum timestamp is greater or equal than the timestamp of some message, then the receiver can safely deliver this message. This approach also has scalability drawbacks. Now we design one pipe for the data centers. A typical data center has multi rooty tree topology. Each host has two rows, both sender and receiver. The routing graph between sender and receiver is a directed acyclic graph. In this deck, each switch and host is separated into two parts, and the dashed arrows indicate a loopback on the network switch. The key design of one pipe is similar to the last Roman, which synchronizes the physical clocks on senders, aggregates the minimum timestamps on receivers, and delivers the messages in increasing timestamp order on receivers. In the last Roman, each sender needs to send beacon to each receiver. To solve this scalability problem, we use a programmable switch to aggregate the minimum timestamp of senders and broadcast the minimum timestamp to all receivers. Each package has two timestamps, a message timestamp and a barrier timestamp. The message timestamp does not change during forwarding, but the barrier timestamp is changed during forwarding. When a switch or host receives a packet with some barrier timestamp from a network link, it indicates that this message timestamp and barrier timestamp of all future arrival packets from this link will be larger than the barrier timestamp. Now let's consider a routing graph of network switches. We can hierarchically aggregate the barrier timestamps through layers of switches one hope by hope. For example, the switch 1A computes the minimum barrier of sender 1 and 2, and broadcasts the minimum barrier to switch 1B and switch 2B. Switch 1B and 2B also receives the minimum barrier from senders 3 and 4, so switch 1B and 2B gets the barrier of all 4 senders. In this way, each receiver gets the barrier of all reachable hosts and links in the network. We recall the barrier property that on each network link, the barrier timestamp is the minimum possible future data timestamp on this link. So, a receiver can deliver messages in receive buffer when it receives a barrier timestamp higher or equal to the message timestamp. Finally, if some network links are idle, it will store the entire network. So, be consistent periodically on each network link to each one hope labors. Okay, this is how one pipe achieves scalability. Now let's consider packet losses. Unlike centralized sequencer, because the timestamps are not consecutive, the receivers do not know whether or not a message is lost. A straightforward solution is to add hope to hope sequence number to detect packets lost. However, this is not capable for many commodity switches. As we will see next, our solution to recover lost packets and failures requires extra round trip time. So we provide two kinds of services. A best effort service that provides ordering but not reliability. For example, a read-only transaction can be simply retried if some of the messages are lost. The reliable service provides exactly one's delivery at the cost of an extra round trip time. Reliable one pipe achieves reliability with a two-phase commit approach. The sender first sends the prepare message to the receiver with a message timestamp. The receiver puts the message into the receive buffer and responds with an egg message. When the sender collects all eggs below or equal to timestamp t, it sends a commit message to the neighbor switch. The switches aggregate minimum timestamp of the commit messages. When a receiver receives a commit timestamp, it delivers buffered messages below or equal to the commit timestamp. 
Reliable one pipe retransmits lost prepare and act messages end to end, while lost commit messages are retransmitted hope by hope. One pipe relies on a highly available controller to coordinate failure recovery of hosts and switches. Please refer to the paper for more details. Next, we come to the implementation of one pipe. We implement one pipe using RDMA unreliable datagram. This is because if we use RDMA reliable connection, each queue pair will buffer several messages, and we cannot ensure the ordering among these messages on the network link. The transport is implemented in software. For implementation on network switches, we consider three types of network switches with different programmability. Using a programmable switch, the switch data plane can aggregate barrier timestamps in the header of each packet. For a commodity switch without a programmable switching chip, we implement in-network processing on the switch CPU. Although it cannot process packets in the data plane, they have a CPU to process in control plane packets. Compared to a typical server, the switch CPU is typically less powerful and has lower bandwidth. Because the switch CPU cannot process every packet, data packets are forwarded by the switching chip directly. If the switch vendor does not expose access interfaces to switch CPUs, we can offload the beacon processing to end hosts. We design it an end host representative for each network switch. Now, the evaluation. We evaluate one pipe in a three-layer factory topology with 32 servers and 10 switches. Now we compare one pipe with other total order broadcast algorithms. One pipe scales linearly to 512 processes, achieving 5 million messages per second per process. The throughput of one pipe is limited by CPU processing and RDMA messaging rate. Reliable one pipe has 25% lower throughput than best effort one pipe due to two-phase commit overhead. In contrast, if we use switch or host as a sequencer, the sequencer would be a central bottleneck. Best effort one pipe with programmable chip delivers the lowest latency overhead, which is almost constant with different number of network layers and processes. End host representatives introduce extra forwarding delay from the switch to the end host. Reliable one pipe adds a round trip time to best effort one pipe. One pipe has low overhead. Processing beacons needs one CPU core per server and only requires three in a bandwidth. There is a memory overhead for send and receive buffer, which only takes a few megabytes. The packet header overhead is 24 bytes per packet. The first case study is a transactional key value store. For read only transactions, we use best effort one pipe because it does not have any side effect. If any of the read requests fails, the client can simply retry the request. This is why we design best effort one pipe. Transactions, including at least rest operation, needs to use reliable one pipe to ensure atomicity. In normal cases, the transaction is completed in one RTT. In both uniform and YSSP distribution, one pipe delivers scalable throughput, which is 90% of a non-transactional key value store. As number of processes increase, YSSP scales not as linearly as uniform, because contention on hot keys leads to load imbalance of different servers. The latency of one pipe is almost constant because servers process read and write operations on the same key in order. Write-only and read-write transactions use reliable run pipe, which is slower than read-only transactions that uses best effort run pipe. With high write percentage, prime latency skyrockets due to log contention and transaction aborts. Now we look at some limitations of one pipe. First, one pipe cannot achieve atomicity of scattering under permanent failures. Second, one pipe requires hosts to synchronize clocks at microsecond accuracy. Bad clocks will impact delivery latency, but not violate correctness. Third, a straggler host or network link will slow down the internet network. Finally, one pipe assumes all participants are not adversarial, and we leave the security problems to future work. In conclusion, OnePipe proposes a causal and total order communication abstraction that delivers groups of messages in Cinder's clock time order. OnePipe achieves scalability and efficiency by utilizing programmable switches to aggregate order information while forwarding data packets as usual. 
one pipe can simplify and accelerate many applications, including transactional key value store, replication, independent transactions, and distributed data structures. Thank you, and I'm ready to take questions. All right. Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, so while we're waiting for questions in the Slack channel, um, I can ask uh, one or two. So uh, I, I know that uh, one pipe is uh, kind of assumes a data center network, right? Um, I'm wondering uh, if you could speculate on what it would take to apply one pipe to non-data center network networks, like arbitrary networks. Um, and I guess at least one concrete difference I can think of is that uh, perhaps the straggler problem gets a lot harder in a system where you potentially have, you know, long links in, in wide area networks, for instance. Um, can, can you talk a little bit more on, on what uh, might not translate or what might translate um, to arbitrary topologies? You may be muted. Oh, actually, uh, it seems like Borja is not here at all uh, anymore. So I, I apologize for missing that. Um, why don't we go to the next talk then, uh, and we'll skip the Q&A for, for now. Um, OK, so the next talk is going to be on click map. Um, so this talk will uh, um, be, sorry, I'm a little turned around. Um, so clique map uh, is going to be from Arjun um, uh, Singhvi. Uh, so Arjun is um, a PhD student at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, working with Professor uh, Aditya Kella. He's broadly interested in networking and systems research with his recent works focusing on RDMA, data analytics, and serverless computing. And so uh, the talk today is going to be about a really interesting production system at Google. Um, why don't we go ahead and play the video? Hello, everyone. I'm Arjun Singhvi, and I'm pleased to present a paper on ClickMap, a distributed caching and serving system at Google. To summarize our work in a single slide, in-memory serving and caching systems are critical components in hyperscale data centers. They are used throughout the industry, at Google and elsewhere. In the previous few years, we deployed and evolved a distributed remote memory access and RPC hybrid system in Google's data centers called ClickMap, in composing RMA and RPC technologies and then putting them into production for a variety of Google services we encountered and addressed productionization challenges, which we summarize here and in the paper. In broad terms, these challenges arise from how to navigate trade-offs. To give a brief overview of the system, ClickMap is a hybrid RMA RPC serving system that builds around the core idea of using two simple RMA reads in sequence to perform a lookup operation. We call this protocol 2 cross R, and it is shown as a sequence diagram on the right. In a two cross R lookup, the first read is from a distributed hash table, which forms an index over all the stored key value pairs. The hash table entry contains a pointer to the location of the actual data itself. A self-verifying checksum ties the two reads together to detect race conditions. As the system has evolved, the logical idea of two reads in sequence still holds, but we've deployed optimizations to cut this down to a single round trip time in some cases. In the three plus years it's been in production, ClickMap has grown beyond a petabyte of DRAM capacity and more than 150 million global QPS. The critical feature of the system is that it uses efficient RMAs for the critical part of lookups and RPCs for all other operations. These include mutations and cache fills, which tend to be less performance critical than cache lookups. They also benefit significantly from the high programming abstraction of RPCs, which we demonstrate later in the talk. While RPCs are the default choice for communication in distributed systems, RMAs has been gaining traction. The key difference between these primitives is that RMAs are essentially fixed function and don't invoke application code at the target. In contrast, 
RPCs are fully programmer defined at the target. At Google, feature rich RPCs offer significant advantages but lag behind RMA operations for outright efficiency. To design a system embracing only one of these key primitives is a fault dichotomy. Systems can leverage the strength of RMAs and RPCs in concert, complementing one another. With ClickMap, we opted for a design in which lookups are performed by RMAs, but RPCs also play a substantial role, including all cache mutating operations such as set or add. We embrace the design in which these two technologies can compose gracefully. To realize this goal of composition and yet also be resilient to the production challenges we outlined, ClickMap builds on the idea of a distributed hash table, which are generally friendly to remote memory access. ClickMap augments the hash table with checksums covering keys, values, and metadata. Clients performing lookups verify these checksums end-to-end -end, and in doing so ensure that RMAs can see a consistent view of the underlying data structure even as it is mutated by concurrent RPCs. Taking advantage of self-verification, our design then adds retries, specifically retries at a level of the stack that makes sense for a particular error. For example, Simple checksum failures are attributed to races against RPCs and are retried simply by issuing fresh RMA reads, assuming such a race will not recur. In contrast, inconsistencies in metadata are retried at a higher level, for instance, after refreshing configuration state from external storage. The principle behind self-verification and retry is to give implementation freedom to the server-side RPC logic. Ultimately, that logic needs to be concerned about making retriable conditions transient, detectable, and rare, easier to achieve than making these conditions impossible or invisible. This brings us to our production challenges. For each, we will present a challenge, how a system building on RMA might be particularly challenged, and also ClickMap's approach to the challenge. Our first challenge is how to navigate the space of availability and cost trade-offs in a distributed system. RPCs are powerful in this context, since they often come with useful features for fault tolerance like deadlines and cancellation, which aren't present in RMA primitives. Like many systems, ClickMap offers a replication in order to tolerate individual failures in the system. The R is equal to 3.2 mode, in particular, provides a means to form a quorum, a majority vote, among three possible replicas. An upside of this design is that a slow or failed replica can be tolerated so long as the other two are responsive and in mutual agreement. As we evolved the system, we later augmented this capability with the introduction of quorum repairs and warm spares to further bolster availability. Our second production challenge lies in delivering a cost-effective system, which means delivering a product that efficiently uses both CPU and DRAM. Choosing RMA as a primitive is largely motivated by CPU efficiency but actually threatens memory efficiency if deployed naively. Making a memory range RMA accessible requires memory registration, a fairly slow process that needs to be done off the critical part, enough so that it's tempting to just pre-allocate large memory ranges in advance. But this approach essentially over-provisions DRAM and risks stranding it. Despite this, we did launch ClickMap initially with over-provisioned RAM but later deployed features to dynamically reshape the backend memory footprints. This change took advantage of the self-verification and retry approach outlined earlier since clients could lazily discover the change in the configuration whenever a lookup would fail benignly. Specifically, it enabled backends to change the size of the memory they advertise to the clients in a recoverable way. The initial rollout saved a substantial fraction of RAM. The plot shows one ClickMap customer's change in RAM footprint. Off note, scaling the backend size dynamically intrinsically ties RAM usage to demand, so that less human interaction is needed in the sizing and operation of the cell, making it easier to deliver on both CPU and memory efficiency expectations. We offer some more technical details on this in the paper. A third challenge to highlight is the need to simply maintain a system over time and further help it to evolve throughout its useful life. While RPC infrastructures can make it relatively easy to change protocols over time, 
RMAs directly expose in-memory object formats between clients and servers. These clients and servers are built from different sources at different times and roll out at different schedules. So changing the underlying format is not straightforward. Here again, ClickMap relies on its self-verification properties, which allow addition and removal of fields from binary objects. This generic approach has proven highly versatile, enabling over 100 protocol changes, large and small, to ClickMap over time, including the introduction of an entirely new primitive like scan and read shown in the graph here on the side. When operating atop Pony Express, a software neck at Google, ClickMap can use a special inbuilt primitive to flatten the canonical 2 cross R lookup into a single round trip. Challenge 4 is language interoperability, which is made more challenging by RMA in that RMA's most prevalent libraries offer C language family bindings, which threatens to root RMA based systems with C, C clients only. While some languages offer native execution options, such as JNI in Java, this approach adds still another level of complexity to the design. Despite these difficulties, tens of thousands of software developers at Google operate day-to-day -day outside the C, C++ language families. Furthermore, established infrastructure uses RPCs to bridge programming language gaps. A critical serving system might be written in C++, but its support pipelines must leverage other languages and both will have a need to access a distributed storage system. ClickMap's initial inability to target non-C, C++ clients made it a non-option for early customer engagements. To correct this strategic shortfall while also keeping complexity under control, we now deploy the normal ClickMap C++ client in a sub-process alongside non-C++ clients. We use IPC mechanisms to route operations and data in and out of the sub-process. Name pipes for Go and Python, and we have also deployed a shared memory solution for the Java client. The graphs on the right plot the CPU efficiency and op latency that results from a sub-process approach. While some of the outright efficiency advantages degrade, ClickMap is accessible from a variety of languages and at full speed and efficiency from C++. A final challenge we highlight is the practical need to operate across a variety of non-homogeneous hardware deployments. Not all servers, NICs, or networks are the same, simply because data centers age and aren't built all at once. Despite this, it's desirable to present near uniform capability, regardless of the age of the underlying clusters. And so we have invested in specializations for ClickMaps protocols to the underlying networks, making it capable of operating on a variety of networking gear. Our paper details how we scale the performance of ClickMap cells differently on different hardware software platforms and take advantage of programmable NICs such as Google's Pony Express to build support for ClickMap's lookups directly into the underlying infrastructure. Our 2 cross R protocol itself was amenable to deployment on one RMA, a non-programmable but performance all hardware RMA solution. By helping to abstract away some of the details of the underlying hardware, ClickMap makes high performance distributed storage accessible to large groups of potential collaborators and internal customers. More details in the paper. As we close the talk, I'll leave you with these remarks reflecting our overall experiences with ClickMap and its productionization. We managed to build a system that combines the strengths of RPCs and RMAs and further managed to deploy it widely. In doing so, we developed means to evolve the system over time by embracing a protocol that could self-correct, in our case, with checksums and retries. We then refined the system over time to address new requirements, support for non-C++ languages, more efficient management of RMA accessible memory, and deep cross-functional optimization with programmable NICs. We hope that future system designers will benefit from this discussion and look forward to systems that can take advantage of our advice. Thank you on the behalf of the ClickMap team. All right, um, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, yeah, we've got Arjun here and joining him is uh, Dan Gibson, um, who's working on uh, Google's Cloud Persistent Disk pro uh, product um, to answer questions. Um, so 
while folks are um, kind of coming up with really interesting things to ask you guys, maybe I have a, a couple um, questions. So one is that um, I guess the public review also mentions this a little bit, uh, but there's this other challenge here, which is security um, and how security ties in with with uh, kind of this um, uh, system that you've built. Uh, can you talk a, a little bit about what the security implications of the system are, as well as what the kind of requirements of the system are? Dan, do you want to take this one? You bet. Glad to. So uh, thanks for the question, Vincent. I, I really agree that security is a, is a very all-encompassing consideration these days. Uh, you know, when we were building ClickMap, we were very fortunate to build upon infrastructure that was essentially already providing security requirements. Uh, you know, broadly speaking, those requirements are point-to-point -point authentication and strong encryption guarantees. Often in hardware, sometimes not. You know, it all, it all depends on what's already deployed. But, um, you know, having an, a system that is insecure is essentially a non-starter in our ecosystem. So, you know, we've been through a variety of security-related uh, reviews and, and procedures, and we're all very conscious and aware of it. It's not mentioned prominently in our paper because it isn't really within scope for our product. Because again, fortunately, we're building on infrastructure that provides most of our security guarantees for us. Got it. That's super interesting that you guys have that. Um, all right. Uh, another question I had, um, I always find it interesting um, to think about what the transition process to these products kind of looks like. Um, so is it possible for you guys to describe a little bit what the previous system looked like? And um, for the uh, people who, you know, the stakeholders, what were the factors of, of Click Map that, that were kind of the biggest selling points for the transition? Yeah, sure. Um, I can take this one too, Arjun, if you want. Um, so th there's really no canonical predecessor system because the ecosystem is very, uh, it's very diverse. And so when you insert something like ClickMap into that ecosystem, it's not always taking the place of something that was there. Sometimes it's a completely new serving infrastructure that's being built, ClickMap becomes a component. That's a different infrastructure from replacing an existing caching system where things like API compatibility becomes important. And uh, you know, when we do a new engagement of any type, we consider the engineering required in order to deploy ClickMap in that circumstance. We're very conscientious about that. Um, Often a, a glue-in situation is not a good use of our time, to be perfectly frank. You know, often the existing systems are perfectly well served by incumbent solutions. What we really try to go for is cases that are transformative. So, you know, when we when we deploy for a new serving platform, we want to make sure we're doing something that's sort of very worth the deployment costs and, and engineering investment of that. And then each engagement tends to be somewhat unique. You know, we work with customers to decide what their key value schema should be. We try to engage deeply in their business and, and help them to understand the resource usage. Because again, one of the services that we infrastructure folks provide is a demystification of the stacks underneath. There's not a lot of understanding of say RDMA. And frankly, there doesn't really need to be because we can handle most of it, but we do try to educate along the way as well. Got it. Interesting. Um, I guess the other half of that question is, uh, uh, you know, you mentioned systems that are okay with what they're currently using. I also imagine you've you've worked with folks and found uh, applications that aren't amenable to this system. Could, could you describe what the properties of those things are? Like, what, where would this system not be a good fit? Essentially. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I have a big spreadsheet of systems like this. The thing that we look for is a read intensive workload. You know, we're optimizing very heavily for the read path and for in-memory use cases that are very update intensive or require special application logic to apply their updates. We're not a good fit because we're not really bringing any special sauce. We send an RPC to a backend like everybody else does in that circumstance. So, you know, while we're happy to see, you know, adoption for the sake of uniformity, we mostly don't focus on, on hurrying those cases because there's just not a lot of, of win. So the ideal use case for us is something that is right rare or completely immutable in some cases, but read intensive. And those are the cases that we're very interested in pursuing. Awesome. Okay, so we'll take one more question. Um, so Adney Cardoza is asking, uh, how might ClickMap change with upcoming generations of programmable NICs like FPGA NICs or other uh, SOC multi-core NICs? 
So I think this one, I can probably start uh, uh, giving my thoughts on it. So, so in clique map, we, we already have uh, the notion of the SCAR primitive, right? Like which essentially tries to reduce the two round trip times uh, of a typical get and it uses the programmability, which is there in Pony Express, which is like a software defined NIC. Uh, so, so I think with programmable NICs uh, also becoming a mainstream, uh, which are hardware based, one could imagine uh, essentially implementing that particular SCAR primitive in the programmable mix as well. Uh, so that would be something which would be useful, yeah. All right, thanks guys. Um, so we've got one more uh, one more talk, um, but I'll note that we finally figured out the issue with Borgia's uh, um, participant um, uh, issue. So we'll, we'll go to him at the end in case you have questions, uh, please put them in Slack. Uh, but for now, we're gonna move to the fourth paper of the session, uh, Gimbal. So this paper is gonna be um, presented by Jae Hong Min, uh, who is a second year PhD student at the University of Washington uh, and is working in, dis in disaggregated system research, especially on storage and new interconnects. So why don't we play the video? Hello everyone, I'm Jae Hong Min. I will present about Jimbo, enabling multi-tenant street disaggregation on smart NIC JBOPs. This is a joint work with the University of Washington, University of Wisconsin Medicine, VMware, and Samsung. Today, the growth of network bandwidth enables disaggregated infrastructure. Although any components can be disaggregated, storage and accelerator are the most common in the data center. The main benefit of the storage disaggregation is high resource utilization from the independent resource scanning. Further, thanks to high-speed networks, the performance degradation is negligible. In addition, there are many innovations, SmartNIC, DPU, or SPDK have been developed to accelerate disaggregation and improve its performance. SmartNIC is very common in today's data center. Although it is primarily used for network acceleration, it can also implement cost-effective and power-efficient JBOF. We use Broadcom Stingray to build our disaggregated storage system. It has a power-efficient SOC with 8 ARM cores and PCI Express root complex to connect to NVMe SSD. It can run Linux on the ARM cores and support SPDK as well. However, there is a challenge in the development of storage system on SmartNIC. It has a small headroom for additional computation. We found that the headroom is 1 microsecond for small I.O. and 5 microsecond for large I.O. While storage disaggregation benefits resource utilization, it inevitably introduces multi-tenancy problems because multiple hosts or applications share the storage. And the lack of support to handle these problems in currently disaggregated storage systems motivated us to do this work. In the following slides, we will discuss the challenges and our approach. Fairness is always a big issue in multi-tenancy and SSH sharing is no exception. A tenant with more outstanding IOs usually takes more bandwidth for example, a tenant with 128 outstanding IOs gets three times higher bandwidth than one with only 32 outstanding IOs in our experiment. Read and write asymmetry is another well known issue for SSD performance. Internal remapping of blocks and garbage collection increase the cost of write operations. More importantly, write IO dominates the bandwidth in a read write mixed pattern and results in unfairness in multi tenant settings. In addition to degrading normal case performance, it hurts the read tail latency as well. Lastly, an SSD shows very different performance characteristics based on its condition. A highly fragmented SSD due to the random write pattern performs significantly worse than the clean one because of frequent garbage collection and read fragmentation. Moreover, the performance degradation is much more severe to write than reads. In addition to these extreme cases, it is also possible that the performance curve is in some intermediate state. We therefore need mechanisms which adapt to both SSD conditions and workload characteristics. Moreover, our solution should be lightweight because of the computing capability of SmartNIC. To address these challenges, we take a black box approach and apply networking techniques. To be specific, SSD is viewed as a complex network system and we borrow the congestion control and packet scheduling mechanism from the networking domain with SSD-specific optimizations. We designed a software storage switch, Jimbo, which has a pipeline architecture. 
Each pipeline consists of three major components, a hierarchical I.O. scheduler, delay-based congestion control, and write cost estimator. In addition, Jimbo provides the managed view of the SSD to each tenant. This view includes the credit-based flow control and I.O. priority tagging. Three major components of Jimbo overcome the challenge we discussed in the previous slides. Due to the time constraint, we don't discuss the right cost estimator. Please check the longer version of the talk and our paper. It is important to know the available bandwidth of the SSD to reduce I interference and keep the latency low. As the SSD internals are unknown and unpredictable, we designed a delay-based congestion control. From the observation on the SSD be latency behavior, we employ a dynamic latency threshold mechanism. A static threshold is not effective because the I.O. latency depends on the size as well as the type. Instead, Jimbo updates the EWMA latency and the threshold on each I.O. completion. It increased and decayed the threshold according to the I.O. latency as the equation described in the slide. As a result, the latency threshold repeatedly approaches the I.O. latency and steps back as shown in the figure. A congestion signal is generated when the current latency exceeds the dynamic threshold. Now, we have a congestion signal and Jimbo implements a token bucket for the rate pacing. There are four congestion states and Jimbo increases or decreases the rate according to them. Please check the longer version of the talk and our paper for the detail. With the delay-based congestion detection and the rate control, Jimbo finds the proper target rate for a given workload and SSD condition. Second, Jimbo implements a fair I.O. scheduling mechanism. The mechanism not only considers the type and size of the I.O., but also takes account into the I.O. processing time with a mechanism called the virtual slot. The I.O. scheduling has a two-level hierarchical structure. Per tenant priority queue provides flexibility for application-specific control, and deficit round robin I.O. scheduler ensures fairness across tenants. A DRR algorithm can slow down the I.O. submission of the greedy tenants in terms of the amount of the I.O. However, it is not sufficient for the I.O. scheduling because the same amount of I.O. might have significantly different processing time in the SSD. Therefore, Jimber uses a virtual slot mechanism as a normalized scheduling unit. The normalized scheduling unit is required due to the discrepancy of the I.O. completion for different sizes. SSD internally processes all I.O.s in 4KB page granularity, so a large I.O. is split into multiple chunks, but it generates only one completion for each I.O. As a result, we cannot measure the exact amount of I.O. processing for the large I.O. A batch submission policy for small I.O.s hurts the I.O. latency and does not solve the completion discrepancy problem. The virtual slot focused on I.O. completion. As you can see in the figure, it does not block the I.O. submission if there, the slot has a room, and generate the completion only when all I.O.s in the slot have been processed, like how the SSD does for large I.O. Although the virtual slot is designed to delay the completion, too much of a difference in processing times between slots is not desirable for the DLR scheduler because the number of rounds for each tenant can vary significantly. Such a situation happens when a slot has a right IOs. To mitigate the issue, Jimbo takes a cost-weighted IO size, which is the actual IO size multiplied by the co right cost. A right IO requires a higher deficit count in order to be scheduled, and occupies more space in the virtual slot with the cost-weighted size. We beat Jimbo using SPK. There are some key parameters that impact Jimbo. For example, we set the minimum threshold to 250 microseconds, which is the latency when there is only one outstanding I.O. in our testbed SSD. And the maximum threshold is 1.5 milliseconds, which maximizes the device utilization. We also set the virtual slot size to 128 kilobytes, which is the maximum I.O. size of our SSD and the most common. Please check our paper for details as well as other parameters. We installed four Samsung DCT983 NVMe SSD on each SmartLink JBuff. During the evaluation, we used two different conditions, clean and fragmented. Clean SSD is preconceived by sequential write to so it performs the best for read and write. Fragmented SSD is preconceived by multi-hour 4KB random write and shows the worst performance of the SSD. We compare Jimbo with other schemes in the table. 
For the schemes requiring a pre-calibration, we use a calibration based on the fragmented SSD. Please check our paper for details. We designed various micro benchmarks with complex mixed workloads. We used FIO2 with the modified SPDK plugin for Jimbo. Due to the time constraint, we will introduce only the result of fairness today. Please check more evaluations in our paper. To evaluate a fairness in a mixed workload, we define a new metric, fair utilization. It is a ratio to fair bandwidth share formulated as the equation in the slide. The standalone maximum bandwidth is the peak bandwidth which the tenant can achieve when it uses the storage exclusively. In the ideal scenario, the fair utilization is 1.0 for all tenants. We run 16 read tenants and 16 write tenants on the fragmented SSD. The workload is 4KB random for both read and write. In this case, the ratio between the peak read and write bandwidth is 9 to 1. In this evaluation, Jimbo performs the best in both utilization and fairness. By taking advantage of the delay-based SSD congestion control, Jimbo shows higher utilization than with pre-calibrated performance models. For an application evaluation, we run the YCSB benchmark on the RocksDB, which includes two optimizations using SSD virtual view provided by Jimbo. We added IO rate limiter, which controls outstanding IOs, and IO load balancer, which steers read requests based on the runtime load factor of a storage device. The graph shows the quality throughput and read tail latency. For the throughput, Jimbo is more effective for update-oriented workloads because it schedules a mixed pattern more efficiently and fairly. On the other hand, Jimbo improves the read talents for a read-heavy workload as well because its flow control mechanism. Overall, Jimbo performs the best for all workloads in both throughput and latency. Today, we discussed the disaggregated storage using SmartNIC JBOPS and outlined three changes due to multi-tenancy and SSD characteristics. They are IO fairness, read-write asymmetry, and non-deterministic device performance. Then we introduced Jimbo, a software storage switch. Jimbo applies a black box approach to SSD and employs techniques from network domain. The three major components are delay-based congestion control, write cost estimator, and the IO schedule with the virtual slot mechanism. They include SSD-specific optimizations and enable Jimbo to adapt to the changes in workloads and SSD conditions. In the evaluation, we showed that Jimbo improves both fairness and latency while keeping the utilization high. We demonstrate that it is not only for the micro benchmark, but also for the practical application using RocksDB evaluation. We hope that our work will stimulate research that can create synergy between state of the art storage and networks. Thank you. All right. Um, thanks for that talk. Um, Again, questions, uh, if you have them, please write them in uh, the Slack channel for this technical session. Um, in the meantime, while folks are coming up with questions, I can ask a couple. Um, so my first one, I guess, th this might be my fault for not understanding, but uh, it, I, I think I understand how um, a single storage switch would work. Um, it does uh, your system apply to a case where you have multiple storage switches uh, in maybe a hierarchical fashion? Um, if so, what, what does that look like? If not, you know, uh, what might have to change in order to make that work? Oh, thank you. That's a great question. So basically, in this paper, we focused on the single switch. So each switch only takes account of a, a single device. So each pipeline is dedicated to the one SS device here. But um, I think I do expect this architecture can expand, can be expanded to the multiple hierarchical switch because we assume the SS device as a small network device and there are multiple channels on there. So if you build a hierarchical architecture in here, then each leaf switch can be seen as a one channel in an in a SS device so that uh, I think uh, yeah, there should be a little bit optimization may require to adopt the hierarchical architecture, but basically I, I do believe that, that this architecture will work, will apply to such a uh, hierarchical architecture as well. 
that's interesting. Um, uh, my other question here um, was that it actually seems like the approach you've taken um, is not sort of specific to storage, right? Okay, it, it takes advantage or it's maybe necessary because of the, the uh, properties of storage disaggregation, but could you take it and apply it directly to other types of disaggregation? So for instance, I would imagine that uh, GPU disaggregation could be an instance where you have the same sort of property where you have um, uh, jobs of different length. Uh, memory disaggregation would be another potential application. Um, have you given any thought to uh, how, how it might translate? So yeah, we discussed a little bit about the different, uh, different memory devices like uh, 3DX point and uh, QLC SSD, which have a very different uh, latency and read write asymmetry and so on. Um, if you if we go to the different devices, totally different devices like a GPU. Um, so the key is that whether it has uh, any kind of asymmetry or a very different uh, processing time for different jobs, and whether we can measure measure such a congestion with the delay of the uh, such a task. So um, yes, if if everything is very deterministic, then I would believe that uh, there would be a better ideas like uh, modeling the performance and so on. But if there is any uh, unpredict unpredictable and um, something very non-deterministic asymmetry, then yeah, yeah, this kind of uh, congestion control based uh, scheduling will work for such um, um, devices or uh, systems. I see. Uh, that's super interesting. Um, thanks for that answer. Um, OK, so, so I guess we have a minute or two left. Um, I wanted to quickly circle back and give uh, Bodia a chance to answer questions as well. Um, so why don't we do that uh, with the uh, we have left? Um, and we'll go back to the question I was asking before, actually. So I'll repeat it. Uh, the question I had was that I know that the you know, one pipe system assumes data centers. You designed it for data centers. I'm curious if it would translate or you know, what you might have to change uh, to go to a different type of network. So, so for instance, a non-up-down data center network, uh, a data center with non-up-down routing, uh, or you know, wide area networks, for instance. Uh, yes, that, that's a very interesting question. Actually, uh, we use the characteristics of data center network over the traditional internet because that it is more reliable and has lower packet loss rate and more predictive, uh, predictive delay and have predict, uh, programmable switches. So it is possible to co-design the distributed systems with your network and transport layer and achieve substantial speed up. And uh, if, for your first question, that if we have a, a routing topology which is not up, up and down, actually uh, we, we are thinking about that, uh, uh, of that, uh, about a non-directly uh, cyclic graph topology. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we think th that we can achieve that with some modifications to the algorithm. We did not include it in the paper, but I think it is possible. And for the quest second question, for the internet, I, uh, we think that the future internet is becoming more and more predictable thanks to the overly networking technology. Uh, so I think that your question opens up an interesting research direction of co-designing the co uh, distributed systems with reliable and more predictable wide area networks with overly networking and the, uh, 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 for example, for the real time uh, uh, video and audio conferences. Oh, thank you. Got it. Awesome. Uh, thanks for that. Um, so that concludes the second session.